Hi class! In this lesson, you will learn about two processes called diffusion and osmosis, which will then be important towards understanding how molecules move into and out of cells. So first, a little review. Do you remember the second law of thermodynamics? You probably learn about it in your physics or chemistry class. Well, in case you don't remember, here's a simplified definition. The second law of thermodynamics states that all systems tend to move towards increased entropy. And this term, entropy, means disorder. The example that's most commonly used is think about your room. What does it have a tendency to do? It has a tendency to become more and more messy, more disordered. So these events, any process that increases entropy, increases disorder, is spontaneous. It does not require energy input. So for example, you cleaning your room, making it more ordered, does require some energy on your part. But the room becoming disordered does not require energy. So that's a simplified example. But here let's look at this um, droplet of food dye that's been placed into a beaker of water. So initially, this is more ordered. But as the uh, dye diffuses through the water, it becomes more disordered, so it moves towards entropy. And this process is spontaneous. It does not require an extra input of energy. Now let's look at what actually is diffusion. So here you can see an example of it. Here there is dye that's diffusing through the water. Okay, let's get rid of that so it doesn't distract us. Now, what, do, uh, what is the actual definition of diffusion? Diffusion is the net movement of molecules from high concentration to low concentration. So here, the molecules are highly concentrated, and they will move towards where they, there's fewer of them, until gradually they are diffused throughout the water. Now, when I say net movement, what I mean by that is that it's the overall direction of movement. These molecules are just bouncing around randomly. They can go in any direction. They can even move towards high concentration. But overall, the majority of them are moving towards where there's lower concentration. So the overall direction of movement is from high to low. Diffusion can also happen across a semi-permeable membrane. Now, a membrane could either be the membrane that's around your cells, or it can be an artificial membrane. Like in this beaker, we have an artificial membrane separating this beaker in the middle. And when I say semi-permeable, that means that certain molecules can go through, but others cannot. So, diffusion across a semi-permeable membrane also happens from high concentration, here it's high, towards low concentration. So the molecules are just randomly bouncing around in all different directions. There is, they don't have a specific intention to move in any particular direction. They just bounce around and because there's so many of them on this side, chances are that they will bounce over to the other side. And gradually all of them, um, they will diffuse so that they are distributed equally between the two sides of the beaker. And at this point, you reach equilibrium. So at equilibrium, what happens is that the movement in one direction equals the rate of movement in the opposite direction. So at equilibrium, the molecules do not stop moving. They just move in towards the right at the same rate as moving towards the left. So that was diffusion. Now let's look at osmosis. Osmosis is simply the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. So it's a specialized case of diffusion. So here again, we have a beaker that's separated in the middle by a semi-permeable membrane. We have water on both sides, and then the red molecules are the solute molecules the solute that's dissolved in the water. Now you can see here on the right side, you have high concentration of the solute. And on the left side is a low concentration of the solute. Now you might think, based on what you just learned, that the solute will move across from high to low. And you'd be right if 
it was able to actually move across. This solute happens to be too big to make it through the little holes in the semi-permeable membrane. So the solute can't move, but the water can. The water is small enough to make it across. And so the water will flow from low solute to high solute. So water will flow towards the higher concentration of the solute as if to diffuse it, make it less concentrated. So you can see here, by the end, the level of water on the right side rises. And at equilibrium, the concentration of the solute on both sides of the membrane will be equal. So water moves from low solute concentration to high solute concentration. And if you think about it, where there's less solute, doesn't it seem like there'd also be more water? There's more space for the water? That's a little simplified, but you could almost think about it that the water moves from where there's more of it to where there's less of it, which happens to be the same thing as moving from low solute to high solute. Now that was a little simplified. To look at more detail, I need to remind you about hydration spheres. Do you remember those? So you might remember that water will cluster around um, charged molecules. So here, the oxygen in the water molecule has a slight negative charge, so it will be attracted to the positively charged sodium. And so water will form this cluster around the sodium, and this is the hydration sphere. Now, if we have a big solute molecule like this protein, water will still form a hydration sphere around it. It just takes a lot more water molecules to cluster around. So now imagine if I have a beaker that again in the middle is a semi-permeable membrane and we have water on both sides and there's these protein molecules and I have more of them on one side, fewer of them on the other side water will form these hydration spheres around the protein molecules. So water will cluster around the protein on both sides of the beaker. Now the water molecules that are clustering around the protein, they're almost, you could think about it as them being attached to the protein. So the protein can't move across, it's too big. And these water molecules are attached to it, so they can't move across either. However, the ones that are not attached to the protein, these that I'm drawing arrows to, these are the free water molecules. These are free to diffuse across. Now, where do I have more free water molecules? Hopefully you realize that um, where there's less solute, that's where I have more free water. So there is more free water on the right side and it will move towards the left. So osmosis occurs in the direction of low solute to high solute, which is the same thing as where there's high free water towards where there is low free water. Now we have just a few terms. Tonicity describes the relative amounts of solutes when comparing two solutions. So a solution, which is called hypotonic, is one that has lower solute concentration when compared to another one. The solution with higher solute concentration is called hypertonic. Now, the way I remember this difference is think about hyper as um, you already used to think about as hyper being having a lot of energy. So think of hyper as meaning a lot. And so the solution that is hypertonic has a lot of solutes. So which direction will water move? Well, when I have a hypotonic solution separated by semi-permeable membrane um, from a hypertonic solution, osmosis will happen in the direction of low solute to high solute. So water will move from the hypotonic solution to the hypertonic solution. Now we have one more, 
Isotonic solutions are two solutions that have equal solute concentration. So when they are separated by semi-permeable membrane, they will be at equilibrium with each other. Water will flow in both directions at the same rate. All right, so let's look at this, how this applies to cells. So here in this picture, there are red blood cells. And say I put them into a beaker. So here's my beaker filled with water, and I have a red blood cell inside. And this water has dissolved sugar. So there's tons and tons of sugar dissolved in this water. And that's the solute. Now the cell also has some solute but maybe not as much as the solution. So which is hypertonic? Well, the solution will be hypertonic. The cell is hypotonic. So which way will water flow? Water flows from, um, high solute, from low solute to high solute. So water will flow out of the cell. And this causes the cells to shrivel up. It's not good for them. Okay, now let's say I put my cells into a beaker of pure water. So this is pure distilled water, no solutes. The cells still have solutes in them. So now the cell is hypertonic and the water is hypotonic. So which direction will water flow? Water flows towards hypertonic. So water will flow into the cells and the cells will swell up and they'll actually burst. Oh, so not good for them. And in the middle, here I have cells in an isotonic solution. So imagine that these are in a beaker that has the same concentration of solutes as inside the cells. So water will flow into the cell at the same rate as flowing out of the cell. So the cell neither shrivels up nor swells. Now let's look at how this applies to plant cells. So here's a plant cell, and again, I'm going to put it into a beaker and with dissolved sugar. So again, the plant cell has some solutes, but the beaker has more. So the beaker is hypertonic. The cell is hypotonic. So water will flow out of the cell into the beaker. And just like the animal cell, the plant cell will shrivel up. Now, there's something different that happens when I put a plant cell into pure water. So here's my cell. And so we have pure water, so that is hypotonic. The cell still has solutes in it, so the cell is hypertonic. And again, what will happen with the direction of water? Water will flow into the cell. So just like the animal cell, the plant cell swells up. But what's the difference? What makes a plant cell different from an animal cell? The plant cell has a cell wall that is very rigid. So when water flows into the plant cell, it will not burst open because it's protected by this rigid cell wall. And the plant cell will just become what's called as turgid. It has, um, it's filled with a lot of water and the water is exerting pressure it's called turgor pressure on the cell wall. So just remember this difference. When I put an animal cell and a plant cell into a hypotonic solution, the animal cell will burst, the plant cell will not. And this is important towards the health of plants. So when plant cells are losing water, the cells shrivel up and the plant wilts and eventually it will die. When there's plenty of water flowing into the plant cells, the plant cells swell and they become nice and turgid, and that's good for maintaining the plant structure. So this concludes our lesson. I hope you found it useful, and I'll see you next time.